Welcome to At Home with Penguin with me, Lisa Jewell. In this series, a writer invites you into their home each week to share some of our routines and some of the things that bring us comfort at the moment. Um, yeah, so I'm Lisa Jewell. I'm the author of um, 18 and a half novels. Um, my latest novel is called, um, unfortunately, I don't have a copy of the UK version, but I do have a copy of the um, the US version. Uh, it's called The Invisible Girl, and it's coming out on August 6th in the UK and October the 13th in the US. Um, <clears throat> currently in the charts, um, which has been, in fact, in the bestsellers now since December, uh, is um, my last novel, which is called The Family Upstairs. Um, so, yeah, lockdown, it's been a kind of weird time for all of us. It's been a particularly weird time for, for writers, I think. Um, my lockdown started with um, what I now understand to have been about of COVID. Um, I've, had, I've had the tests done, and I had the antibodies. So I spent the first couple of weeks of lockdown in bed um, and have slowly sort of, as I've got over that, um, and got back into into real life, tried to build up some sort of routine. When you're a writer, routine is everything. And losing that routine for a while completely sent me into a, into a tailspin. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do, or how I was ever going to get back to being a writer. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a bit of a blow to my processes at the time. Um, but something occurred to me. <laughs> I was using a lot of excuses for the fact that I wasn't writing for the first few weeks of, of um, lockdown. Um, and then I realised that one of the main reasons, quite beyond the creative process, why I wasn't writing a lot during lockdown is because my house was full of people. And every time I tried to find a quiet corner to sit in and do some work, someone would someone would decide that mum was the person that they wanted to see. Um, my 16-year-old daughter decided that the best place in the house for her to do her college work was at the kitchen table, which is where I've historically done my writing. Um, so, in fact, this, this room in which I'm talking to you from is my bedroom. This is not where I write. <laughs> uh, I don't actually have an office. I have a kitchen table, which has now been taken over by my 16-year-old. Uh, so the place that I've been working... Um, is a little office over the road. I realised about six weeks into lockdown that I couldn't make any any more excuses for not writing. Um, so I um, found myself an office space. So now every single day at about two o'clock, I take my laptop um, and I cross the street and I go into my office and I put my laptop down and that's now my writing space. Um, usually, um, in non-lockdown times, I like to write uh, in coffee shops if I'm not writing at my kitchen table. And again, coffee shops are not allowed into those anymore. So yeah, so at the moment I'm doing all my work in um, a temporary office, which is, yeah, it's been very effective. I'm quite pleased with, with how that's worked out. Um, so obviously apart from writing, um, there's I write for about three hours a day, which still leaves massive chunks of day to fill when I'm not doing all the things that I used to do uh, during uh, before lockdown came and took all those daily chores away from me like the school run and go I used to go to I used to go to the supermarket twice a day back in the day um, and I'm only allowed to go once a week so the things that I have been doing that have I would say brought brought me joy during these weird times um, is but the main thing has been walking my dog um before lockdown she was going to daycare every day um so that i could you know keep my days free to get on with work um and she was obviously the old daycare place shut down and i've had my dog with me every single day so the main focus of my day apart from writing has been my daily dog walk and i've been taking that dog for way too long walks i've been over walking her she's been <laughs> half killing her i've been like trying to get as far away from my house as i possibly can um in in the space of you know a, a couple of hours so we've been here there and everywhere and that has been an absolute joy um the other thing that has been bringing me joy is television oh praise be for television i mean i know we're here to talk about books but my that a highlight of my day has been the moment at which the dishwasher is loaded, the dog is walked, 
and I sit down in front of the television. I have been, um, yeah, I've plowed my way through loads and loads of box sets. Um, me and my teenage daughter, my 16 year old, have been watching all sorts of wonderful, weird and wonderful reality shows as well. Um, and I think the other thing that's brought me a lot of joy every day, and I don't know if anybody else can relate to this, is going to bed. <laughs> Um, I just feel like, you know, it's like a tally on the prison wall. I know we're not in prison and things could be so much worse, but every night when I get into bed, I think that's another day done in this weird, weird world we're living in. Another day closer to when we can get back to some sort of semblance of normality. So, yeah, bed is bringing me tons and tons of joy at the moment. Um, but, yeah, but, yeah, so obviously, as well as watching TV and walking my dog and working, I am a big big reader and I've been reading some fantastic books I'm going to show you a book first that actually I haven't didn't read this during lockdown I read this um last time I was on holiday remember those um and yeah it's platform seven by Louise Doughty it's um so it's a it's a it's a psychological thriller but it's also a ghost story and I'm showing you this because I know this just came out in paperback this week and I think everybody should go out and buy it in paperback um, and make this one of their lockdown reads because it's absolutely compelling and chilling it's it's set on um platform seven of Peterborough train station which is yeah kind of odd um but uh yeah so the character the main character is actually dead and she's trapped there as a ghost um, and looking back on her relationship with her ex-partner, who may or may not have had something to do with her demise. This, I had to I had to pick up something. I mean, there was a lot of talk at the beginning of um, the pandemic about the Spanish flu, and I felt very, very much like I didn't know enough about the Spanish flu, and I wanted to see if I could draw any parallels. Um, and this is just, yeah, really really easy read a really compelling read it was actually it was quite quite the page turner and actually made me realize how very different um covid is to spanish flu which was more like the bubonic plague than anything else um and then this i always love i always love the book of the moment i'm a big big sucker for the book of the moment and this was as as lockdown began this was the book of the moment and it just arrived in my uh in my mail um, just in time for some lockdown reading. Um, it totally lived up to the hype. It's about a 15 year old girl who starts an affair with her 40 something professor at her boarding school in America, um, falls madly in love with him and is still in love with him when we meet her in her early thirties, um, even though they're not in a relationship anymore. And then some other girls from the boarding school she was at start to um, lodge complaints about him having abused them while he was there their professor um, and so obviously that makes her completely reevaluate something that she thought was the greatest romance of all time and then uh, Safe this is another American book this is if you like a book that keeps pulling the rug out from under your feet uh, where you kind of you keep thinking you know what you're reading and then two chapters later you have to um, think again because that's not what you were reading at all it's twisty and turny it's about um, a young girl who went missing um, when she was five years old and returns to her family home when she's 21 but obviously it's it's not quite as simple as that I can assure you it's by SK SK Barnett um, which I think brings me to the main the main event which is um, books that bring me comfort which would suggest rereading um and i am not a rereader i don't think i've ever read the same book twice apart from maybe my childhood books um but i i went through a very interesting um experience last year i moved out of the house to have it renovated and when i came back i had fewer bookshelves so i had to do a massive book cull um i actually had to get rid of a thousand books um and the way I did that was I used the, the, the Murray Kondo technique of um, touching something and holding it and seeing if it brought me joy. And I did that with each and every one of my books. So the books that remain, of which I think I've probably got another thousand, um, maybe somewhere between 500 and 1,000, every single book on those bookshelves is a book that brings me joy, whether that's because of the way it looks or how I felt while I was reading it or the way I connected to the characters in the book or the impact it had on my life. Um, 
or in a lot of cases, they're books written by friends of mine who I adore and couldn't possibly get rid of one of their books because it'd be like getting rid of a bit of my friend. Um, so it was really, really hard for me to choose one book that, you know, comforts me because they all do in one way or another. Um, so I just chose two books, in fact, that have very specific memories of bringing me comfort. Um, I've chosen two because I'm not entirely sure that the first one is still available um, to buy, uh, certainly not firsthand, um, but it's called The Book of Ebenezer Lepage by G.B. Edwards. Um, and this was a book, I was on holiday with my ex-husband in my early 20s. Uh, we were in a tower on, on the island of Jersey, the tower in the middle of a field. Um, which had 360 degree views of the island. And on our first day there, we had an argument and my ex-husband was a um, bit of a sulker, bit of a fan of the silent treatment. It was also raining, even though it was summer. And we were stuck in this tower and he wasn't talking to me and there was nowhere to go. And I was miserable and this was, this was on the bookshelf there. And I picked it up um, and so I mean, it's just one of those books that you would only pick up on, a, on the bookshelf of a holiday rental. It's not the sort of book that you, it would jump off the bookshelves at you in a bookshop. Um, and it's a story of, um, I sh I'll read the back blurb, actually. I think that's probably easier. Ebenezer Lepage, stubborn traditionalist and deeply perceptive chronicler of local life, is a Guernseyman through and through. His world bordered by rocks and sea, he has witnessed an extraordinary period of change from horse-drawn carriages to men landing on the moon as well as the destruction of the old ways. His vivid evocation of fierce island feuds, passionate friendships, wars between the sexes, sadnesses and joys, speaks with a universal voice, absorbing, original and richly authentic. This is a classic novel of its kind. Um, and in fact, um, as William Golding says on the front, to read it is not like reading, but living. And that's exactly how it felt when I was reading it. I felt like I was being transported away from this miserable tower with a miserable husband <laughs> and miserable weather into, it was like it was like the most remarkable soap opera just unfurling. I was completely absor absorbed in his community. Um, and that was massively, massively comforting to me at the time to have that book to escape to. Um, but the book I've actually chosen, which, um, I have such an old copy of it, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's not even, I think it's published by Penguin now, and this isn't even the Penguin version. Um, I think this might be one of the original 1995 copies. Um, but anyway, it's, yeah, High Fidelity by Nick Hornby, which, and this, I mean, you can almost smell the swimming pool on this because this is the copy of the book um, that I took on holiday in 1995. Um, and read by the swimming pool and um, kind of just I'd never read a book like this before I'd never read a book with a voice that was so familiar to me um, and so authentic and so immediate um, that I just felt like I knew this guy the minute I started reading his book and that was where the first seed was sowed in my head that I might actually want to write a kind of girl version of a book like this. And it was this very holiday, in fact, where I had the conversation with my friend, um, which people who have been following my career probably know about this conversation with my friend, uh, where she persuaded me that now was the time. I, if I wanted to write a novel, now was the time. Now was the time to do it. Don't make excuses. Stop prevaricating. Just do it. Um, and she made me a bet and we shook hands. Um, and it was as a result of that bet that I wrote the first three chapters of my first novel, Ralph's Party, which without which I would not be sitting here today um, talking to you <laughs> about my comfort reads. Um, so, yeah, high fidelity. Um, there you go. It's, it's just... Uh, a really, really comforting and soothing read. I'll just read you the first paragraph to give you a flavour of it, if by any chance you've not read it. This is the very first paragraph. This is the, the launch into the book. My desert island all time, top five most memorable split ups in chronological order. One, Alison Ashworth. Two, Penny Hardwick. Three, Jackie Allen. Four, Charlie Nicholson. Five, Sarah Kendrew. These were the ones that really hurt. Can you see your name in that lot, Laura? I reckon you'd sneak into the top ten, but there's no place for you in the top five. 
those places are reserved for the kind of humiliations and heartbreaks that you're just not capable of delivering. That probably sounds crueler than it's meant to, but the fact is that we're too old to make each other miserable. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So don't take your failure to make the list personally. Those days are gone and good riddance to them. Unhappiness really meant something back then. Now it's just a drag, like a cold or having no money. If you really wanted to mess me up, you should have got to me earlier. Right, so I think we are ready to take some questions. Um, well, I'm certainly ready to answer some if any of anyone's got one. Ah, there we go. Have you found lockdown? Well, I think I might have answered that question already, Diane. Um, it's, I tell you what has helped about this, um, this whole concept of me having to uh, go and rent myself an office is um, I'm paying money now for space to write in. <laughs> and that really focuses the mind. So yes, the fact that I've had to move out of my own house in order to write, to, to do my work, to write and pay money for that space has very much focused my mind. And I'm at the phase of, of, of a book where I would normally find it quite easy to be distracted. Um, but sitting in that room that I'm paying for has meant that I have been absolutely religious about writing my thousand words every day without any distractions whatsoever. So yes, in that way, it's been good. Was your switch to commercial psychological thrillers a natural evolution as some of your earlier work has subtle notes of domestic thrillers? Ah, well, Nina, I don't know when you say earlier works, if you're talking about, I think that I feel like I have three, uh, three zones or three phases in my, in my writing journey. Um, so my first novels were romantic comedies, uh, relationship novels. Um, and then I moved very, very slowly, very gradually, almost so that you wouldn't notice if you were reading the books in order that I was doing it into, um, I, I guess you'd call them family dramas. So I don't know if those are the books that you're referring to when you say the subtle notes of domestic thrillers, but there certainly was, there, there were layers of that in those books. There was the secrets and the bad thing that happened and the reason why someone might have killed themselves or the, but um, I think, moving into psychological thrillers has involved a, a, a lot more dead bodies um, and um, crime scenes and police police turning up at people's front doors to ask questions and what have you. Um, so those are the, 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 the three phases that I see in my work and definitely getting from romantic comedies via family dramas to where I am now has been, as you say, very much a natural evolution. I've been very lucky that Every time I've I've pushed things, I, I could like push push myself a little bit out of not my comfort zone, but what I feared might be my reader's comfort zone or my publisher's comfort zone. Nobody's ever recoiled and said, "Stop now, you can't do that. You must go back and do what you were doing before." Everybody's always been you know, very positive about every little edge I've made towards getting darker and darker. So, yes, it's been very gradual and very um, organic. My favourite out of the books that you have written so far is in She Was Gone. Do you have a favourite? Oh, hi, Nikki. I recognise Nikki's name from social media. Hi, Nikki. Um, I kind of, yeah, I think I have a favourite. I was just talking about the three phases um, and I think I definitely have a favourite from each one of those. Um, so from my romantic comedies, my favourite is definitely Vince and Joy. Um, and from the family dramas, it's uh, the house we grew up in, which is a kind of sprawling family, epic family drama about um, a family who live in the Cotswolds and in, in, in an actual literal chocolate box. Well, it's not a literal chocolate box cottage, but it's a thatch cottage and it's beautiful. But um, something dreadful happens um, to that family, which leaves a terrible scar on them. Um, and the mother develops compulsive hoarding disorder. So, yeah, it's um, it's a story of how that impacts on the whole family and how the family separates, disintegrates, but then finds their way back together again um and then from the thrillers i don't know i think i'm having to say the family upstairs at the moment purely because i think i went big on that one i went out of my comfort zone um into places i've not not 
tried writing about before um and it was i think didn't feel ambitious when i started writing it but when i look back on it i can see that it was quite ambitious um so yeah i'm quite quite pleased i pulled that one off so yeah i would say that's my favorite of the thrillers Do you give your books a title before or after you've written them? Oh, hello, Teresa. I know Teresa as well. Um, I always have a working title and they vary very rarely. My dog is barking. I do apologize. That's because I think someone might be bringing me something quite exciting at the door. We'll see. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I always have a working title. And I think on occasion I've been allowed to keep the working title, but nearly always they get they get scrapped. Oh yes, yes, give it to me. <laughs> I'll show you what this is in a minute. This is quite exciting. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, for example, the book I'm writing at the moment, which is my nineteenth book, it has a working title, and I've told my UK editor what the working title is, and she really likes it. So, oh, I might get to keep it, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, can I just open this envelope and show you what's in here? Talking of titles, because this is the first time I've seen this. As I was just saying, I didn't have a UK version of my next novel, but it's just been brought to me. That's the first time I've touched it. There it is, Invisible Girl. Um, wow. That's that's quite that's quite a thrilling moment. That is quite a thrilling moment. Um, so I'm trying to remember what my working title was for Invisible Girl. Uh, but it, it was an invisible girl. I can tell you that that came later. <laughs> what would you recommend for someone who is an aspiring writer to do to get their work out there or how they can go about getting published? Well, there's pretty much, unless you're a celebrity, there's pretty much only one way of getting your work out there uh, and getting published. And that's to, that's to write a book, um, to maybe if you feel it, it needs it to have it looked at by a, a professional editor uh, if you're confident enough without that you need to um you need to send it out <laughs> you need to send it out to agents agents are still the gatekeepers to the publishing industry um so you need to find yourself someone who loves your book and is willing to you know because they have to fight really really hard an agent has to do an awful lot of work to get a book a publishing deal and so they have to absolutely love it um so you need to get it out there to as many agents as you can until you find one who absolutely loves it and then then well then it's the agent's job to get you published um so yeah three things finish it get it out to an agent and then let the agent get you a publishing deal um I know that might sound simplistic, but it's it feels like the right answer to that question. Where do you get your ideas for the storyline from? Uh, well, that that's different with every book. It's not like I sort of have a like a magic box and I open it and there's an idea for a storyline. They come they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So I was talking about the house we grew up in a minute ago, uh, which was a book which felt like it came to me as um, a theme, as a picture frame. I really wanted to write about a family affected by having a parent with compulsive hoarding disorder. So I had this big picture frame that I needed to fill with detail and colour and characters and story and what have you. Um, but then something like the family upstairs, um, that well, that wasn't a picture frame that came to me as a tiny tiny seed of an idea um which was uh, a woman i saw on holiday in 2017 in the south of france who just captured my imagination she looked like she had a story to tell uh, and i couldn't stop thinking about her and the more i thought about her the more layers i embellished her storyline with until i got to the point where i thought i really want to write about this woman um but i didn't have anything in mind for her so i kind of just had to start the book and and work out what she was doing there and where she came from and yeah so e each book is completely different as I say sometimes it's just a big question that comes to you then she was gone the big question that came to me was imagine if you'd lost your child and they'd been missing for years and you suddenly found out that they'd been living next door the whole time um 
uh, sometimes it's a theme you want to explore and sometimes it's just a tiny little seed of something that gets inside your head and you just can't you you can't stop thinking about it so there you go which authors do you like to read and inspired you to become an author well gosh i couldn't have answered that question any more precisely than old nick nick hornby uh without whom i may never have had that conversation with that friend and may never have um uh, uh, sat down to write my first novel so Nick Hornby completely directly and entirely um, inspired me to become an author but obviously before I read Nick Hornby every single book I ever read that I enjoyed formed part of that um, you know the impetus the, the the thought process processes that get anybody anybody who finally writes a book into the chair to start writing a book um, which authors do I like to read? I like to read very, very much in my genre. Um, I'm, I, I used to be a really adventurous reader. I used to like go into bookshops and just spend hours trying to find the most obscure, obscure books um, that I could possibly find um, and writers I'd never heard of. And um, I don't do that anymore. I've become quite lazy. I just want my quick fix and I want to know that it's going to be page turning. And so, yeah, I read... I read the big books, the books that everybody's talking about, and I read an awful lot of um, psychological thrillers um, by my contemporaries. So, yeah, quite a quite unadventurous, but a very satisfied reader. <laughs> Do you have a set routine for writing every morning, every day? Do you map out the bones of the book, then flesh it out? Right. Well, yes, yeah, set routine for writing very much so. So pre-lockdown, I would sit at my kitchen table. Um, I, would, I would spend the morning doing all my admin um, and social media. Then I'd have lunch and then I'd start working at my kitchen table after lunch. Uh, now I've been driven away from my kitchen table by my my darling daughter um into my office so it's the same routine just in a different place so yes and I give myself about three hours to write a thousand words and I write a thousand words every day when I'm being a good girl which is nearly all the time I must say I'm pretty much I'm pretty much a good girl when it comes to sticking to my thousand words um and what was the other part do I map out yes and every day I do write absolutely every day apart from when the ironically when the children are off school which they are all the time at the moment uh do you map out the bones of the book uh no I do not my my books have no bones whatsoever they are flabby boneless things um and I have no clue before I start writing the book really where I'm going or what, what, what it's going to be or how it's going to end up um yeah so I'm kind of I would say probably about a chapter ahead of the reader most of the time in terms of knowing what happens next and what really happened and who done it and why and um, how it's all going to end up. So yes, I do what I've now um, decided to call because it makes it sound better than flailing and panicking. I, I plot on the page, that's what I do. I plot as I write um, and that's sometimes that's directly from my brain onto the keyboard and sometimes I do a bit of plotting when I'm in the shower as well, but that's that's kind of it really. <laughs> Are your characters based on people you know? No, they're not, Tina. No, that would be, that would be number one really tricky because then I'd have to meet those people in real life. Um, and number two, actually quite boring because one of the things, and I, I know that people who read me a lot are very fond of my characters. And I think one of the reasons why they're fond of my characters is because I just enjoy creating them so much and I enjoy making them up. Um, and I enjoy giving them layers and layers and getting to know them as I write them. That's part of the joy of it. Whereas if I wrote about somebody I already know, then I wouldn't have all that fun kind of getting to know them myself so no they are not based on people I know oh David what is the lovely framed print behind you well I thank you for asking uh this is um so this is a oh I don't know her name what's she called and she's got a weird signature which I can't read but she used to do cartoons in the Guardian um and I saw this in there uh, just before my 50th birthday in a art shop um in Chelsea and um I just loved it and my sisters have been asking me what I wanted for my 50th birthday so 
I saw that and I said to them, I've seen what I want for my 50th birthday and it's in a picture shop in Chelsea. So there you go. And it says, I like reading, which I do. Good question. Okay. Well, thank you so very much for joining me here in my, in my boudoir um, this evening. It's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for all your questions. Um, I just wanted to remind you quickly, in case you were you'd forgotten or wanted to make a note of my my comfort reads. Um, the book I I have no idea if you'll be able to find this um, if, in bookshops anymore. It's uh, possibly gone out of print, but yeah, the book of Ebenezer Lepage by G.P. Edwards, and who could forget High Fidelity by Nick Hornby. Um, so you can find me if you want to chat with me anymore. I'm on Twitter, Lisa Jewell. UK. I'm on Instagram, Lisa Jewel UK, and I'm on Facebook, and I do take friend requests from people I don't know in real life, so you can see lots of pictures of my dog and what have you if you want to join me there. And do check Penguin's social media for more updates on the At Home with Penguin Books series. Thank you so much. I've loved every minute of chatting with you all here tonight, and uh, take care, and see you soon. Bye.